I'm Brian Bromley. I'm a clinical associate professor of obstetrics and gynecology at the Massachusetts General Hospital and with an appointment in OBGYN and radiology at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. Today's lecture will be on malarian duct abnormalities, both congenital and acquired, and their impact on perinatal outcome. The advent of 3D sonography has been instrumental in our ability to detect uterine congenital anomalies. Those of us who are obstetricians and radiologists involved in reproductive medicine have known that malarian duct anomalies are associated with a wide variety of adverse perinatal outcome. This includes things like recurrent miscarriage, preterm labor and birth, intrauterine growth restriction, malpresentation, incompetent cervix, and postpartum bleeding. Interestingly, malarian duct anomalies typically don't prevent conception and implantation. A study by Heinonen and Furt and Sturt in 1983 looked at 228 women with malarian duct anomalies. 9.1% of them had primary infertility, but most had other issues as the etiology of their inability to conceive. Now, any of the numeric data that we use uh, for outcome or prevalence concerning malarian duct anomalies is quite fuzzy. And the reasons behind this is that most of the major studies use widely different populations. Some include fertile women, infertile women, women with reproductive pregnancy losses, all which affect the numbers. On the other side, there are many women with malarian duct anomalies who are asymptomatic and don't present for medical care. In, general, in the general population, however, there are, the incidence of malarian anomalies is approximately 4.3%. In the infertile population, this is 3.5%, and rises to 13% in women with recurrent pregnancy loss. One of the better done studies looking at the frequency of malarian duct anomalies was done by Simon et al. in 1991. They looked at 679 fertile women who had a laparoscopy or laparotomy prior to a tubal ligation, followed by a histosalpingogram. 22 of 679 women, or 3.2 percent, were diagnosed as having a malarian duct anomaly. The anomalies that they saw were 90 percent septate uterus, 5 percent bicornuate uterus, and 5 percent didelphic uterus. Looking at other patient uh, populations, Opelt et al. reported the distribution of anomalies that was considerably different. Um, they reported a 35 percent septate uterus, 26 percent bicornuate uterus, 18% had arcuate uteruses, 10% had unicornuate uteruses, 8% had uterus didelphus, and 3% had agenesis of the malarian system. Now, there are different classes, uh, classification systems. The most commonly used was a modification of the original system by Buttram and Gibbons in 1979 where the American Society of Reproductive Medicine identified seven classes of uterine abnormalities. And the classification is based on the degree of failure from normal development, the symptomatology, the treatment, and the prognosis associated with these outcomes. And many of you may be familiar with this classification system, which is outlined here. Now briefly, uh, embryologically, the mullerian ducts are paired structures that form lateral to the ovaries. The uh, inferior portion extend mediocaudally and fuse together. The inferior duct then develop into the uterus, the cervix, and the upper vagina. Uh, 
This, the origin of the lower vagina is distinctly different. Followed by the fusion, there is resorption of the medial wall of the septum. Notably, the fallopian tubes are of different cellular origin and are generally not involved with malarian duct anomalies. And similarly, the ovaries arise from the mesenchyme and epithelium of the gonadal ridge and are not influenced by the formation of the mesonephric or paramesonephric ducts. 3D ultrasound has been monumental in our ability to diagnose uterine anomalies because we can get a volume acquisition from a series of 2D images and display them in any plane that we want. The coronal plane is the most important plane to identify malarian abnormalities because it shows the triangular shaped endometrial cavity as well as the serosal surface of the fundus of the uterus. The technique for obtaining the, cor the coronal view was described by Dr. Abu Hamad and has been termed the Z technique. This is an example of how it would be done. You can see on image A that the endometrium is aligned so that it is parallel to the horizontal axis. The reference point and positional um, dot is placed on the endometrium. Then one goes to the B coronal plane and you can rotate it again around the Z axis up and down the towards the fundus of the uterus, again, with your reference point in the middle of the endometrium. This allows you to have a perfect coronal view of the uterus in the C plane. And here you can see that you can identify the triangular-shaped endometrium and the surface contour of the uterus in its convex appearance. One can also use a rendering modality to evaluate the uterus. Here we are decreasing the size of the uterus. Again, in image A, aligning the endometrium parallel to the horizontal plane, going into the B plane, looking at the transverse image, aligning that, and there's our rendered view of the uterus in the coronal plane. We can scroll in and out and look at the outer contour. We can look at the endometrium and its normal triangular shape. And this is a normal uterus. Similarly, we can look at a uterus with a congenital anomaly. Here we enlarge the image. In screen A, we are putting our reference dot in the middle of the endometrium. Now we're moving our reference dot in the transverse view to the middle where the defect is, back to image A where we're again realigning the endometrium so that it is parallel to the horizontal axis. This gives us our coronal view. We rotate the coronal view around the z-axis so that it shows itself in its traditional orientation and can scroll back and forth through the volume, looking at the cornua, looking where the cervix might be identified. Now if we want to render the image, we go up to an, the render mode. And again, we align on the A image, our endometrium, so that it's parallel to the horizontal axis. We move our green line to the area of interest. Then we proceed to B, where we rotate our transverse view of the uterus so that, again, our endometrium is horizontally aligned with the x-axis. Back to the A plane to perfect the endometrial orientation. And there we have our rendered image in the D box, which we can turn into its traditional orientation. And again, we can scroll through the volume, looking at the cornua. We can evaluate the outer surface of the uterus, showing that it is convex 
and evaluate the endometrial lining as it splays towards the fundus. We can go on to measure the uterine septum. Using our calc package. The calipers go across the base of the septum and down to its deepest depth. And our measurements are there in the right hand lower quadrant. Now, this is instrumental. Many people will say that they can tell on 2D that there is splaying of the endometrium. This is obviously a bicorneate or a septate uterus. But I would say that both these images at the top look fairly identical. And if you look at the coronal view, they're very clearly different. The left image is a mild indentation that you would see in an arcuate uterus, while in this image you can see a deep septum extending down into the lower uterine segment. Similarly, these two coronal images are fairly identical. But if you do the coronal plane, you can see that this outer contour is indented, characteristic of a bicorneate uterus, while the outer contour in this image is convex with a broad-based septum in a septate uterus. Now, to go over the different criteria for diagnosis, a septate uterus results because of a defect in canalization or resorption of the midline septum between the two malarian ducts. The external contour is convex, flat, or mildly concave, and there are two separate endometrial cavities. You may have a complete septum, as in the image on the left, or you may have a partial septum, as in the image on the right. These are 3D reconstructed rendered images of a complete septate uterus. The outer contour is convex. There is a broad-based tissue bridge extending down from the fundus all the way down to the cervix. Same thing. Convex septum, broad base tissue, all the way down to the cervix. Septa may be complete or incomplete. These are examples of incomplete septal uteruses. Again, the outer contour of the fundus is convex. There is splaying of the endometrium with a tissue bridge that extends partially down towards the cervix. And in a different patient, another image of a septate uterus with your convex fundus your splayed endometrium with the tissue bridge extending only partially down the uterus. 3D ultrasound has been, as I mentioned before, incredibly important in the diagnosis of uterine anomalies. Wu et al. have reported a sensitivity of 100% with a specificity of 80%. Sonohysterography adds to our ability to be certain about our diagnosis. We can clearly see the endometrial cavities, which, if the endometrium is not thick, may not be quite as apparent on normal 3D ultrasound. And Alborgorzi colleagues have reported a sensitivity and a specificity of 100% using sonohysterography. Now, a variety of adverse reproductive outcomes have been reported. Um, with the septate uterus. This is a coronal view of a septate uterus, and you can see a small gestational sac within one of the horns. This is a transverse view of the same uh, patient, again with a small gestational sac in one of the horns and a little yolk sac. Septate uteri have the highest risk of adverse reproductive outcome, and this may be due to a variety of reasons. Two of the hypotheses have been abnormal vascularity to the uterine septum or abnormal endometrium.
Grimbises did a re large review of reproductive outcome with septate uteruses, and my point is not to have you memorize the exact outcomes because the data is very fuzzy. As I mentioned before, uh, a lot of the studies are done on different populations. There are different ways to classify the anomalies, um, different diagnostic methods by which the data was acquired, and so on and so forth. However, the important point is to realize that the risk of pregnancy loss from spontaneous abortion is as high as 28%, 14.8% will deliver preterm, and 56% will have a term delivery. Of these women with septate uteruses, only 66% had living children. Now, hysteroscopic metroplasty has been shown to be useful in improving, improving reproductive outcome. Um, this is a different study by Homer et al., hence the different numbers, where pre-hysteroscopic metroplasty, the miscarriage rate was close to 90%, uh, the disparate numbers being due to different populations studied, and the term delivery rate was quite low at less than 10%. After the resection, the term delivery rate was way up in the high 88% range, and the miscarriage rate was more in the mid 15-20% range. The goal in the surgical management is to restore normal uterine architecture and preserve fertility. I'm grateful to Dr. Leos in Jordan for providing me these images of historoscopic um, resection of a septum. Uh, you can see this is looking into the septate uterus. You can see the septum right here, and it is taken away, and this is the post-septate uh, removal images. Now, a less than one centimeter residual septum is considered an optimal resection. Moving on to bicornuate uteri, these occur when there's a failure of the malarian ducts to completely fuse. And there are different types. There's the bicornuate uterus, which has one cervix, which has been termed unicollis, and the bicornuate uterus with two cervices, which has been termed bicollis. Arbitrarily, the definition of a bicornuate uterus has been a fundal indentation of greater than one centimeter. Here you can see a coronal view outlining the fundus and a big dip between the two horns of a bicornuate uterus. One endometrium is splayed this way and one endometrium is splayed that way. We can measure the degree of indentation. Another method of Classifying a bicornuate uterus is a fundal indentation below the interosteal line or less than five millimeters above. This is another way to measure this type of bicornuate uterus. This is the transverse image of that uterus. In comparing, this is a septate uterus. We talked about the convex outer fundus, and you can see that there is a lot of tissue on top of the inter, a line drawn between the interosteal points. This is an example of a bicornuate bicollis uterus. This is the coronal plane. You can see the fundal indentation, the splayed endometrium, and you can follow them right in their two separate endocervical canals. This is a 3D representation of a patient with a bicornuate uterus. You can see the fundal indentation, and in this case, the patient has an IUD in the middle of the bicornuate uterus. Now, bicornuate uterus is the most common of the Mullerian duct anomalies to be associated with cervical incompetence. The reproductive outcome was amalgamated by Grabeises et al. Uh, they reported on 261 women with bicornuate uteri, resulting in 627 pregnancies. Again, the rate of miscarriage is very high at 36%. 23% of pregnancies delivered preterm, only 40% delivered at term, and 55% of women had a live birth. 
A unicorn uterus occurs when there's failure of one of the Mullerian ducts to elongate. And this is seen on the right side more than the left. Uh, this is the netter drawing of a unicorn uterus on the left. And on the right, you can see the 3D coronal view of a unicorn uterus. Now, the unicorn uterus has been divided into several categories. It can be isolated. There can be a communicating horn, as you can see here, a non-communicating horn where there's no communication between this vestigial horn and the main horn. You may or may not have an endometrial cavity. And as I mentioned, occasionally they are isolated. This is a standard 2D ultrasound of a uterus where this is the transverse view of the fundus. This is the sagittal view. And I think years ago we would have passed this as a normal appearing uterus. However, if you throw on your 3D and you do a 3D reconstruction, you can see that this is a very abnormal shaped uterus and in fact is a unicorn uterus. This is another example of a unicorn uterus on sagittal standard sonography and with the 3D coronal plane. And another 3D image of the reconstruction of a unicorn uterus. This is an example of a unicorn uterus with a rudimentary horn. You can see the unicorn main horn here and the small rudimentary horn with some communicating endometrium. This is a unicorn uterus with a non-communicating horn with endometrium. This is the unicorn side. This is the non-communicating horn with a little bit of endometrium up here. This is an example of a unicorn uterus where a 3D reconstruction has been done. The rendered image here shows that you have a unicorn uterus with a fused horn, but no endometrium within that fused horn. Now, reproductive outcome for women with unicorn uteri is poor as well. Again, a third of these patients, a little over a third, will have miscarriages and pregnancy losses. 16% will deliver preterm and only 44% will deliver at term. There are 54% live births in this population. Now, it is generally accepted that removal of a non-communicating rudimentary horn with functional endometrium is in fact a reasonable thing. It reduces dysmenorrhea, endometriosis, and the risk of ectopic. In and of itself, however, it does not impact on reproductive outcome for the one part of the horn that is present. Importantly, however, if one does get pregnant in the obstructed horn, there's an 89% uh, risk of uterine rupture, and that is an obstetrical catastrophe. Now, unicorn uteruses or any of these uterine abnormalities may have some of the more standard uh, issues that we see with regular uteruses, and this is a unicorn uterus with a large endo cervical endometrial polyp. The uterine didelphus occurs because of complete failure, failure fusion. This is a transabdominal scan of a uterus didelphus. You can see one horn here and one horn here. Again, a larger image, one horn, the other horn. Uh, Grimbizes et al. looked at 114 women with uterus didelphus and having 152 pregnancies. And again, the reproductive outcome is similarly poor. Here's an image of a uterus didelphus with a normal appearing left horn right here and a right horn that has a fetus within it. And later on, you can see there's your left horn, which is normal appearing, and your right pregnant horn with the amniotic fluid. Now, 20 to 40 percent of women with malarian duct anomalies will have an associated renal anomaly. 
In an obstructed horn, many of the times, this is an ipsilateral renal agenesis. Other types of abnormalities that might be seen are horseshoe kidney, duplicating collecting systems, pelvic kidney, and ectopic ureters. So it's always crucial in a person who's diagnosed with a malarian duct anomaly to perform a formal evaluation on the kidneys. Now the arcuate uterus is a somewhat controversial finding. Uh, some people have classified it as a septate or bicornuate uterus. Other people have considered it a variant of normal. The outcome data is widely disparate. Here's a 3D ultrasound showing the coronal view with a convex contour and a broad-based tissue band that extends just minimally down the endometrial canal. The outcome for pregnancy for an arcuate uterus has been very variable. In this study by Grimbizes, the outcome was quite poor, as in with other anomalies. However, the live birth range, looking at other studies, has been as good as 83%. And it may be that many of women with this type of relatively mild anomaly go undiagnosed, and we're not really aware of what their outcome, their better outcomes may be. Diethylstibesterol is a synthetic estrogen that was introduced uh, into clinical practice between 1949 and 1971 and was used for a variety of poor obstetrical events such as miscarriage, bleeding, etc. Women exposed to this in utero have a variety of uterine abnormalities, most commonly the T-shaped uterus. And this is an example of a coronal view on its side of a T-shaped uterus. You can see the T-shaped endometrium extending down to the cervix. And this is a 3D representation of a woman with a T-shaped uterus. You can see a normal convex outer fundus and the T-shaped endometrium. Now, acquired malarian anomalies are things like fibroids or polyps or maybe uterine synechia. And for the presence of fibroids, these occur in about 20 to 40 percent of women during their reproductive years. However, it really depends on what population you're studying. They are seen in 2.7 percent of women having a second trimester ultrasound. Uh, they've been identified in 12.6% of women undergoing IVF, and in as many as 25% of women who have been undergoing IVF with a donor egg. This is a sagittal image through a uterus. This is the endometrium, and you can see this small hypoechoic area protruding into the endometrium, characteristic of a submucosal fibroid. I'm going to limit my, con my comments to submucosal fibroids because subserosal fibroids have no known effect on fecundity. Intramural fibroids are highly controversial, and if they do have an impact, it's probably not an enormous impact, but that remains to be definitively assessed. Submucosal fibroids are thought to decrease implantation rates, lower clinical pregnancy rates, and are associated with a higher risk of miscarriage. This is a coronal view of a uterus and with a large submucosal fibroid extending into the endometrial cavity. A 3D reconstruction shows the rendered image at the time of a sonohysterography of a fibroid. This is the fluid and this is your essentially completely submucosal fibroid. Um, this is what that type of fibroid might look like on hysteroscopy. Again, I want to thank Dr. Leos for providing me this hysteroscopic image. It is felt in general that surgical removal of submucosal fibroids are associated with a higher implantation rate. Cassini et al. in a study in 2006 looked at a group of women who had had a greater than one year um, plight of infertility and had fibroids. They looked at spontaneous conception after surgical removal or non uh, or no surgery in these women. And they found that women who had surgical removal 
of their fibroids, a spontaneous conception was achieved 41% of the time as opposed to 21% in women who had not had a surgical removal of their fibroid. Endometrial polyps are a different uh, subject um, and endometrial polyps occur as an overgrowth of the endometrial tissue. You can see this projection into the endometrial canal shown on a sonohysterography with a feeder vessel characteristic of an endometrial polyp. Endometrial polyps are seen in between 16 and 26 percent of patients with unexplained infertility and between 0.6 and 5 percent of patients with recurrent pregnancy loss. Perez Medina et al. looked at 215 women with endometrial polyps and there were some of them underwent hysteroscopic polypectomy, others underwent hysteroscopic um, evaluation and biopsy of the polyp, and they looked at pregnancy rates after four cycles of IUI. There were a total of 93 pregnancies in the group, 64 having occurred in the women who had had the resection of their polyp, and 29 where the polyp was left alone with the exception of the biopsy. Interestingly enough, 65% uh, actually conceived before the planned IUI. So there may be a slightly increased risk, uh, slightly increased likelihood of pregnancy if the polyp is removed. Having said that, this is also controversial because Lassadal have shown using IVF or ICSI that there is no difference in pregnancy rate or miscarriage rate when the polyps are less than two centimeters. Moving on to intrauterine adhesions, intrauterine adhesions are seen in 1.5% of the general population and they're seen in between 7 to 30% of women undergoing hysteroscopy after a miscarriage and subsequent curatage. Most often we see these kind of intrauterine adhesions after either a postpartum curatage or a postabortal curatage. This is a coronal view, of an image of a woman with intrauterine adhesions. You can see the endometrial cavity is a little bit more echo bright like you would normally see. And then you can see these strandy pieces of tissue crossing the endometrial cavity in no specific alignment. This is characteristic of uterine synechia. Now the classification of uterine synechia is available from the American Fertility Society, now called the American Reproductive Society, and is based on the extent of cavity involvement, the type of adhesion, and the menstrual pattern that the woman has. This is a woman who had had two DNCs after a retained placenta and had an abnormal bleeding pattern. This is the sonohistorography of her uterus, and you can see that there is a large structure extending across her uterus um, with no particular orientation which would suggest either a septum or any other congenital anomaly. This again is a transverse view of a uterus in a woman with a synechia. You can see the little tissue bridge extending across the uterus in this transverse view. Schenker et al. looked at 292 women with intrauterine adhesions. 45% became pregnant, however, there was a high risk of miscarriage and a high risk of preterm delivery. Now, adhesion removal has been associated with an improved pregnancy outcome. Valley et al. in the American Journal uh, reported on 187 women having 143 pregnancies. These women all had intrauterine adhesions. Here you can see a sonohistorography again with a woman with adhesions. This is the transverse view of the fundus of the uterus. And below it is the sagittal view, here it is, of the uterus. And you can see this hypoechoic uh, tissue bridge extending, and here it is up here. The removal is associated with a much better reproductive outcome than that his, than historical controls.
Now the pregnancy rate does depend on the type of adhesions and the degree of cavity involvement. This is a hysteroscopic image of what some of these adhesions might look like. Uh, the live birth rate is 81% after removal of mild filmy adhesions and not so great after dense adhesions. Thank you.